Americans are capable of achieving extraordinary things when they have the freedom and opportunity to do so. This is American Potential, and here's your host, Jeff Crank. All right, welcome to the podcast. Listen, America is the land of opportunity, and people continue to come here to pursue the American dream. And like most of our ancestor immigrants, the world today, it still yearns to come to America for hope and for opportunity, for liberty and for freedom. And you know what? People still risk their lives on small rafts in shark infested waters to come here to the United States. And we see the stories of people fleeing despotism and heartache just for the chance to get to America. And I'll tell you what, sometimes it's easy for us, I think, as Americans to forget how precious freedom really is. We get accustomed to it. We get comfortable. We take it for granted, if you will. But liberty still tugs at the hearts of men and women around the globe. And some people pursue the American dream by following the rule of law, and some don't. And we can't talk about immigration without talking about border security. The two go hand in hand, and there cannot be immigration reform without border security. Border security is a top concern of the American people. And a nation of laws must have a legal immigration system that works, and ours doesn't work right now. It is broken. When the United States Customs Service apprehends people that are on the terrorist watch list, coming across the border and into the United States, that should get every single American's attention, right? Drugs that are killing American teens at an alarming rate are coming across the border. And again, a nation of laws must uphold those laws. If you seek to be a nation of laws, you can either uphold laws or you can change them, but you can't ignore the enforcement of laws and still claim to be a nation bound by the rule of law. You just can't. And having a weak border empowers dangerous cartels. People are dying on both sides of the border, and immigrants seeking a new life are dying at the border as they are encouraged to cross illegally by an administration that refuses to see both a security crisis and a humanitarian crisis. So immigration reform is something that needs to be talked about, and the American people are demanding answers. And one thing is clear, any immigration reform package that can pass Congress must have increased border security as a key component, and it must provide for a compassionate solution that Americans demand. On today's podcast, We have the president of the Libre Initiative, Daniel Garza, to talk about immigration and border security. Daniel, I'm so happy to have you on. I really think you're one of the great experts on this. You live on the border. We're going to get to all of that. Thanks for being with us. Uh, Jeff, what a pleasure. Um, Thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, I look forward to our discussion. And you're right. I do live on the border. I live uh, almost uh, exactly a half mile from Ansaldúa's bridge, where you have a lot of the crossing that takes place. And uh, of course, I'm, I'm impacted daily by what happens here on the border. Now, I'm going to come I'm going to come down to McAllen, I think, in uh, I think in the next month or so. And I'm going to do a couple of border visits. And I hope to do some stories, bring some podcast episodes from my visits uh, to the border. But tell us, what, what do you see every day when, when, when you do this? I mean, you must see heartbreaking stories at the border and stories that probably make you angry, too. You know, the border is, is complex. You see people uh, filled with hope, um, you know, seeking the American dream, uh, coming to the promised land. But then, of course, you see heartbreak. You see violence. Uh, you see smuggling, uh, cartels, uh, people being exploited. Uh, a, a humanitarian crisis that you were talking about. Look, I mean, we're working with partners to clear the path to historic reform that, that is creating, I think, a better immigration system and, and making America stronger and welcoming and safer. But Jeff, when, when the approach to immigration is to neglect security, uh, undermine our vetting systems, uh, induce illegal entry with, with the ill-advised executive actions, 
you know, while, while our agencies are overwhelmed, exhausted and understaffed, uh, you know, Americans are going to get concerned. It, it's imprudent, right? And, and it is compromising the safety of Americans. And I think worsening really a sort of this two-tiered society of citizens and an underclass of undocumented people residing in the shadows. This is not a desirable situation for our country. Yeah. And so tell us some of the things that you see. I mean, to most Americans who don't live, you know, on the border or maybe even live, you know, in places where, you know, just kind of untouched by this problem. Tell us what you see. Tell it, put, put it in our minds, kind of what it's like on a, maybe not on a daily basis, but I'm sure occasionally. Well, it's a daily basis. I mean, yeah, I, is I, it a daily I, basis? In, in, okay. in, the, in the nightly news here, the local news channels, and if you talk to police and, and you know, I have four nephews who are border agents. Um, you know, th- th- there's this, this is the world that we live in, right? Uh, and mm-hmm. it, there's a status quo that we've had now with absolutely no reform except for executive actions. And this administration has just been woefully inadequate, right? When it comes to, um, I mean, robust executive actions, but, but of course, you know, what, I think the, the consequences of, of bad policy and bad executive actions uh, puts lives at stake. And the status quo here ignores, you know, the sexual exploitation of, of women, the, the human smuggling that involves now American citizens who use their own vehicles, you know, to, to traffic people back and forth. Uh, other folks who get uh, recruited by the cartel on, on the on the uh, on the Mexican side in Reynosa or, or uh, Brownsville or I should say Matamoros, children abandoned at the border. Uh, you're talking about fifteen thousand kids this past year who left just you know with no mother, no, no father uh, to tend for them. Um, cartel violence and rival warfare that that is uh, killing people. Uh, um, the bloody narco traffic crisis. Uh, has swept up innocent victims here. There's kidnappings often. I think you just heard um, last week sometime in the news, uh, four uh, black Americans, you know, who, who were caught up in, in this sort of kidnapping triangle, uh, this forced recruitment by the cartels, you know, for, to, to, to kidnap and, and, and to get involved in the narco traffic and enslavement of, of, of young women and, and forced to, you know, prostitute themselves uh, for the profit uh, and the benefit of, of the cartel system. It's an industry. It really is. It's, it's, it's a literal business. It's an enterprise that has been allowed to fester uh, by Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who is the Mexican president, who has this approach to, to all, uh, what, all this stuff that is happening with the cartels and, and, and border. It's called uh, hugs, not bullets. It is just astonishingly um, inept, uh, absurd, uh, I think, and and it, and it is uh, killing people. How, how much of it, though, is is our policy? I mean, how much of it is the U.S. government's, you know, sort of inviting this this system of mayhem at the border? America is facing a historic crisis right now at its southern border under President Biden. His policies, like I was talking about in the poor me- uh, messaging. Uh, right now, the number of undocumented immigrant crossings at the southwest border for fiscal year 2022 topped 2.76 million. That, that, that broke the record by a million uh, migrants. Wow. Think about that. All right, that, that that's a, according to Customs and, and, and Border Protection data. Uh, uh, and this was induced by Biden because in his first 100 days in office, uh, he took more than 94 executive actions on immigration. That included uh, stopping the construction of the border wall in, in certain areas, attempting to halt deportations for 100 days, literally a moratorium on all deportations, uh, suspending new enrollments in, in, in the migrant protection protocols, what they called remain in Mexico, uh, terminating asylum cooperative agreements uh, between, you know, Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador, wh- where a lot of the folks are not coming from. Uh, ending, you know, the, the uh, prompt asylum case reviews, you know, so now we've we've allowed or paroled into the country um, uh, 2.75 million people. Uh, th- th- this is unsustainable. Um, and it, it sends a message across the entire, you know, Latin American or South American continent. We have an open door. We, uh, now's your chance to get in because we have lax policies, basically an open door. And of course, uh, this this causes major problems in all these other areas that I was talking about. So how do we, we we talk about border security? It's easy to say we need we need border security. That's an easy statement. Any politician can can say that. What do we do to have better border security? 
Well, you know, there, there are bipartisan solutions right now that have been proposed uh, by both Republicans and Democrats. And so you know, there is there's um, there's very few folks who are willing to do this bipartisan effort to reach across the aisle and um, do things like the Border Solutions Act, which would cr- um, immediately begin the construction of four new courts along the, the South Texas border and, and, and give us 300 judges, 300 prosecutors uh, and, and caseworkers, another 300 uh, border agents, uh, just so they can adjudicate cases faster and people will know if they qualify for asylum or refugee status immediately. Wait, well, they don't have mm-hmm. to be released into the country, right? And we know that the, the, a very small percentage actually do qualify uh, and, and will ultimately get in under asylum status. But people are gaming the system because they know all they have to do is say, I'm here as an asylee. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, in political danger if I go back to my country. And so they, they need a court date. And, and, but because we don't have the courts to sustain it all, they're released. In fact, they're flown to their city of preference from the McAllen Airport uh, to wherever they want to go uh, uh, on tax dollar. Um, so it's it's a crazy system right now. And it's and it's absolutely overwhelmed. And, and what is this? We talk about the impact again for, for most Americans who don't live in a border community. They don't you know, this is a little bit removed from them. They see it, but they don't see it every day. Explain what it means to, you know, to the mayor of McAllen, Texas, or to the police chief or the, you know, so that on a daily basis, this is an impact that they have to deal with. Yeah. See, we're the point of entry here, right? So it it, it taxes our educational system uh, because of the sort of the uh, transient uh, migrant population that is coming in. They'll stay around for a while and then, of course, they'll move on. But it it, it also, our hospitals, our clinics, um, the the centers that, that, that help them. Uh, to, uh, you know, of course, find a place in, in America are overwhelmed. The, the Catholic charity services are, are overwhelmed. Our police and law enforcement are overwhelmed. Look, the, the, the laxed enforcement also, um, you know, is causing um, public safety issues. Uh, I think the Biden administration has intentionally limited uh, immigration enforcement in America, w- which I think has led to like record low immigration enforcement in, in this last year. But, but consider mm-hmm. this, Jeff. ICE. You know, which is the enforcement arm of, of, you know, of, of the Immigration Service. Um, the, the, they arrested in, in 2021, um, believe it or not, uh, it was uh, almost 200,000 non-citizens uh, for associated charges and convictions, including what was 22,000 assault off- uh, offenses, uh, 8,100 sex and sexual assault offenses, 5,500 weapons offenses, and 1,500 homicide-related offenses and 1,100 kidnap offenses. There are some, you know, th- th- this, this is putting Americans in peril here. And so under the Biden administration, just to be specific, they arrested 48% fewer criminals and deported 63% fewer criminals than in, in the previous administration. Uh, with the kind of numbers that we are seeing, this is woefully inadequate enforcement uh, of of immigrants that are coming into America who are, who are committing crimes and, and putting Americans in peril. So I want to talk about you know we've heard the the phrase DACA and explain to to folks who are listening what that means. What is DACA? How how should we try and have a fix or a solution for DACA? But we can't get there without having also having border security. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah the the. DACA, of course, uh, was an executive action by the Obama administration uh, because, according to them, we're frustrated with uh, congressional inaction in addressing dreamers in America. Dreamers, of course, were uh, kids who came to who were brought to America, not a decision that they made. They were brought here by their parents or, or by a guardian, an uncle, an aunt or whoever. Right. And they've grown up in America, right? And so all they know is America. And I, there is a lot of support from the uh, Americans, American citizens, to to give them a permanency. Um, but because Obama acted precipitously, instead of waiting for Senator Marco Rubio, who we knew was going to drop legislation on this and already had bipartisan support, uh, he created an executive action that left these these folks in limbo. Because once it, it uh, expired. It was up to now every administration coming in to to continue the, the, this program, uh, this deferred uh, prosecution of, of young adults. And, and so what's happened now is that they're growing up. Right. And you have six hundred and sixty thousand or so 
DACA recipients who are now in limbo and about 2 million dreamers who didn't qualify, you know, un- under DACA, but are still young under the same sort, sort of certain conditions. Republicans are saying we won't pass uh, DACA legislation until we get some assurances on, on enhanced border security. And Democrats say, no, we want a clean DACA bill, right, with, with, with no ties to, to border security. And that's the standstill right now. Uh, both mm-hmm. sides have dug in. And so we, we like, like all, everything else having to do with immigration, it's become a partisan issue. And um, it, it, of course, continues the status quo, which is not productive for America. Well, and, and uh, the previous administration, as I understand it, did propose a fix that would include a solution for DACA with increased border security. And we never got there, did we? We supported it. We, we, we were excited right. that uh, President Trump actually had proposed citizenship, not just for the 660,000 DACA recipients, for the two million dreamers. But of course, the left was stuck on this thing that they didn't want to um, uh, approve. $25 billion for, to extend wall in certain areas of, of the 3,000 mile, I'm sorry, the 2,000 mile border uh, uh, between U.S. and Mexico. And, and that was it, right? Now, again, the two sides dug in, nobody moved from their fixed position, and we couldn't arrive at consensus to get a bill done. And, and I, I just thought it was a wasted opportunity that we had, you know, uh, somebody uh, of, of, the, of the tenor and I think uh, as uh, you know, whose pre-stated position was very uh, hard against, you know, the uh, permanency, uh, uh, you know, for, for folks who had uh, come in illegally. But, but he was willing to, 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 I think, to reach a consensus, uh, but the left would not have it. And, and so here we are again, still the status quo. So as, as we look at a solution here, I mean, it clearly, I, I guess I just don't understand why anybody would be against border security. Why would somebody not want to, with, with the numbers you're talking about, right? These prosecutions, these, these crimes that are being committed, why would we not want to control that? Well, Jeff, uh, it, it boggles the mind. I mean, th- think about this too, you know, cause you were talking about it's a humanitarian crisis and my heart goes out to the migrants too, right? They come with hope. And, you know, again, uh, the, 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 I guess what, what my parents wanted, right, was to, to, to achieve the American dream. But 890 of them died along the border uh, because of, you know, weather conditions or, or, you know, because they were just caught in the border or in, in the deserts and, and, and couldn't make it out. That's a 58% increase over 2021. Our border agents are getting assaulted right now. There was about 554 assaults on border agents. Their lives are also at risk here because of yeah. the increases in in, in, in um, uh, illegal traffic. And then of course, you know, the, the exploitation of vulnerable migrants, uh, Doctors Without Borders has identified sexual violence as one of the most heinous problems in, in Mexico and Central America uh, because of, of what is happening. So we, we need to move on here with some smart legislation uh, that's both going to, of course, strengthen America and, and border security, but is also going to reduce, you know, the, 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 this, these tragedies that are happening along the border because Biden has has put up a welcome sign. Um, and, and then, of course, they, they learn different once they arrive at the border that it's not easy to get into America sometimes. And you have to do it with the help of cartels and human smugglers. Uh, it, it's just a dirty, dirty business and a very dangerous game that people are playing here. You and I were talking, uh, I think it was last week, we, we were talking a little bit about this, but you talked about just the safety issue, even like personally, you said when you 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 have to drive through Mexico sometimes uh, to visit relatives and like there's just towns you will not stop in, right? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Um, the, the narco traffic, the 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 cartels control the city of Reynosa, and because the the, the Mexican president is unwilling to enforce um, it, basically um, common sense laws, you know that where where you know, now. Innocent citizens are being killed on the Mexican side of the border. It's created an environment where it's it's highly dangerous. It's more dangerous than Iraq, Iran, uh, in some places uh, like North Korea. Uh, so my parents live on the other side of the border. They're about an hour and a half, you know, to, to your point, uh, uh, to on, on, uh, before you get to uh, the city of Monterrey, Nuevo León. And, and I'm having to cross every three to you know three to four weeks. And I, I just put my head down and, and drive right through Reynosa and, and, and you know, and to, you know, the, the, the point I'm trying to get to uh, and, and, you know, try to get, stay under the radar and, and not, you know, um, uh, get anybody's attention. 
it, because it's a dangerous um, environment now that, that has been created because of, you know, the cartels controlling this entire region all up and down the, the South Texas uh, area on, on the Mexican side. Of, um, so it, 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 it is creating um, a, a dangerous um, environment for, for uh, American citizens, right, you know, who travel to and from uh, the border. And, and there are thousands and hundreds of thousands of us that do that. Uh, so it, it is a very dangerous place to go. Now, on top of you know everything I've been saying, remember that you know it is still illegal uh, to traffic um, heroin, uh, fentanyl, um, you know, cocaine, marijuana, and so you know it, people are caught up in in this traffic, right? And mm-hmm. every, everything uh, travels through through the same um, uh, areas of traffic, and and so you put, you're putting Americans' lives in danger. Well, I, again, these are stories that I think most Americans, they hear about stuff like this, but they don't live it. So it's it's um, it's always great to have someone like you come on and talk about this and to talk about, I mean, you see the other side of this too, right? The heartbreaking stories. I, I think I've heard you talk about seeing people from your from your own house, right? Trying to cross a border, migrants coming across. Um and, and are in desperate situations down there, right? Yeah, that, you know, that's the thing about the Latino community in the U.S. that, you know, and, and now a lot of, you know, uh, non-Latinos you know, who go to church with folks who are undocumented, who go to school with them, who work with them, uh, who are neighbors with them, right? Um, they, they are living under the shadow, in the shadows. And, and like I said, this is a two-tiered system that we're creating here uh, that, that is not desirable for America and the, which is why I think, it, you know, we just desperately need to, one, take control of the border and then uh, let, let's wrestle with what we're going to do with the folks that are already here. Uh, and for a lot of us, you know, the, the, um, look, we need to meet labor demand. We need to unify families. Uh, th- there is, a, uh, I think, a, a lot of benefit you know, that we can draw from immigrants. And, and we have for over 250 years now, America has um of course, been strengthened uh, because of, of the contributions of immigrants and, and continue to do so. But because of our free market system, we have been able to accommodate flows and flows of poor immigrants, unskilled immigrants, uh, because, of course, they, they bring a value uh, um, in, in our labor markets. And then they create gen- uh, wealth for themselves and wealth for others and move on and up uh, to, you know, because of the businesses that provide and, and meeting consumer demand. We can continue that, but we cannot overwhelm the system. Otherwise, um, it is going to, of course, um, create other economic issues. Uh, and then, of course, there's the safety issues that we have to deal with. And this administration just seems indifferent to all that. Let me ask you, you mentioned uh, workers, right? What about farm workers? I mean, this is this is an area, I think, where most Americans see that, that this could be a, obviously a need that needs to be filled but we have to have a legal system to do that. And, and we do in some ways now, but it's not sufficient. Talk about maybe what we could do, what laws we could pass that would help in that area. Yeah, b- because Congress is unwilling to move on the 15 million or so folks that are here currently undocumented, it, then there are certain sectors in our economy that, that, are, that are caught in, in the status uh, quo uh, that, that is keeping people in the shadows. And, and one of them, is uh, the this farm worker community. There are 2 million farm workers currently across America. And it is estimated that about 80 to 90% of them are undocumented. Look, I grew up a farm worker uh, with my, my parents and, and, and my family, uh, working the fields and the orchards in California and in, in the state of Washington and Nebraska. And I can remember on four or five occasions when the border patrol would come in and make a sweep through the fields and, and they would pick up you know, folks who were undocumented. Uh, But we had the safety and security of knowing we were U.S. citizens because I was born in America. Um, uh, And so they they didn't, you know, sort of mess with us, you know, the border agents. But it was it was gut wrenching to see how people were pulled, you know, from from, you know, where where they were working and and, and being productive and and industrious, you know, to to, um, and helping our economy or contributing to our economy in a very real way. So what people are saying is, you know, why don't we just maybe carve out an exception for farm workers? And God bless, you know, uh, 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 Dan Newhouse from the state of Washington, the congressional, uh, the fourth congressional district, who is working with Democrats and other Republicans who's proposed a farm work modernization act that would, of course, you know, give us um, a regularization to a lot of the folks that are currently undocumented working as farm workers. Uh, because, you know, uh, it, 
there is right now a massive need uh, in the agricultural industry, you know, to 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 pick the vegetables and the fruits and, and the food, you know, that 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 uh, you know we need on our table. Uh, it is, I think, a crisis in America uh, on the need that we have for farm workers, and a lot of the the the, the fruits and, and vegetables are staying uh, out in the fields and the orchards because of the lack of farm workers. So we need reforms that are going to help us meet that labor demand. Uh, and some make sense. Uh, and so I think it is necessary that, that we do carve out, you know, some exceptions now. And and so your argument here would be we need to have this, but it needs to be it needs to be legal. It needs to be a system where people aren't living in the shadows. It's it's something that we understand. We set up a, a mechanism to deal with this. And uh, but as to get there, you also have to have some kind of border security package as well. Right. Uh, look, absolutely. Look, um, I mean, I think all of us, except for Native Americans, you know, have parents, grandparents or, or great grandparents who came as immigrants. They came to work. They, they came to make it in America. Right. They came to contribute. And, and so if we can identify those folks who are coming to, to leverage their skills, their talents and their labor, well, let's get them to be productive. Right. And, and so th- that, that those are the kind of immigrants that, that we need in America and that we desire. Right. But. If you come to exploit America or ex- ex- uh, um, put Americans in danger, uh, we want to know that, that 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 is your intent and 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 keep you out, uh, frankly, uh, of America. Uh, and so right now, what's happened is because of the partisanship, as I was saying, Republicans have sort of dug in on border only or border security only, and Democrats on legal channels only. And we need folks, you know, who are going to reach across the aisle. Uh, because Democrats don't get to define what immigration reform is, and neither do do Republicans by themselves. They need to come together uh, and reach, of course, consensus so that they can get enough votes to pass smart, sensible reform that is going to make us stronger and, of course, going to make the border stronger. Uh, but we can do both. We can do both security and legal channels that, that will strengthen America. Daniel, you have a great story. You love America. And I've, I've, you and I have talked about it. Um, you know, you have a great story. I want to get into some of that because you were, I have my, on my notes here, a high school dropout. You went from work at being a high school dropout to working in the White House. And I want to ask you about that. But before we do, I want you to tell your story, like your family's story, too, about coming to the United States. And, and your family loves this country. Yeah, uh, my parents, uh, they, they saw America as the promised land. You know, when they married, uh, um, you know, they, they saw America as the country that they could achieve what they could not achieve in their country of origin uh, in northern Mexico here. Um, and yeah, I, I often you know, quote this passage from um, uh, Woody Guthrie in a song that he sings about the Jode family from The Grace of Wrath, the book by John Steinbeck, uh, where he mm-hmm. says, you know, they came up to the promised land. Or they came up to the mountaintop, it says, and, and it looked like the promised land, a rich green valley with a river running through it. There was work for every single hand, they thought. There was work for every single hand. And, and that's what my parents came to do, right? They came to work hard and to save their, 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 their money and then risk it on a business, you know, and, and, and they were entrepreneurs. Uh, they, 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 um, they spent, I think, way too long in the fields and the orchards, but you know, once they were able to uh, um, save enough money, they, they bought a, a motel in a small town in the state of Washington. And we were on our way, you know, to, to, to the middle class. And, and of course, I got a second chance, um, you know, because we were still working in the fields, I wasn't able to finish high school. Uh, but my second chance was getting a GED and become a police officer. And it was during that time, Jeff, you know, where, where I saw that, hey, man, um, I need to look beyond myself because my community suffers from chronic alcoholism, domestic violence, gangs. Uh, narco traffic, it's all this stuff that was going on that I didn't realize because my parents were Christian parents, right? You know, you know, deep in values. And I, I just never saw this stuff, you know, uh, until I was exposed to it as a police officer. So I decided to get involved and, and, and ran for city council and won, identified myself as a Republican. And then, of course, became involved with the party and then worked for the congressman, you know, once he won in, in 1994 uh, with the Gingrich Revolution, they called it. And then went to work for the president of the United States at the White House. Jeff, at 17 years old, I was a high school dropout with no prospects of a professional career. And 17 years later, I'm working at 1600 Pennsylvania for the most powerful person in the world. I mean, what a country, right? It's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a great story. What an amazing story. And it's it's really this the immigrant story that so many Americans have. Right. Um, and, and it's not too far in the distant past that most Americans, uh, you know, have that story where they're 
ancestors came over That's right. uh, to the United States. So um, talk a little bit about the Libre Initiative and what the Libre Initiative is and uh, what, what you all are about. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, there are things that make America different. And I feel strongly that our, our democratic republic system, uh, our founding charters, the Constitution, the Declaration, the Bill of Rights uh, are just incredible documents that, of course, restrain government power and government control uh, from oppressing the people. That, that, as Lincoln said, this is a government of the people, by the people and for the people. And I, I just felt so strongly that the Latino community had sort of been shut out of, of the democratic process for way too long and needed to rise up and be a vanguard for these freedoms, right? You know, that, that they were benefiting from uh, the free market system, individualism, um, the, the, a limited government, all these things that were necessary, private property, sound money, uh, that, that they needed to be aware of what these things, of the value of these principles and to defend them. And so the Libre Initiative really was, was formed to defend th- those, those, uh, those founding principles of, of America to con- so that it can continue to accommodate for flows of immigrants who want to work hard and achieve the American dream, uh, create wealth for themselves and, and others. Um, but I did learn the lessons from my parents who came to America with no English, no high school diploma, uh, and no driver's license. It was, how can we accelerate that process faster, right? Remove those barriers that so many people take for granted uh, so that we can position people in the marketplace better. And, and I think once oh, opportunities are opened up to people because we remove barriers, they become champions of those, of, of those free market policies I, instead of getting you know, hoodwinked into believing that somehow uh, America needs to trend to, towards more socialist policies or look to government as the answer to every social ill under the sun. We want to keep people away from that, but inform them as to why the ideas of freedom are superior. That, that's such a great uh, mission. And uh, I, I so appreciate all that Libre does uh, in, the, in these areas. How do you, if people want to know more, what, what, can, is there a website? How, how can they get in contact with you? Absolutely. You know, there's, there's several ways. There is, of course, the website, www.belibre.org, B-E-L-I-B-R-E. Uh, you can also visit us on Facebook. We have about a million followers, uh, the Libre Initiative. On Twitter, Libre Initiative or at Libre Initiative. Um, we're on, uh, I believe, also uh, Instagram. And then I don't know what the other young kids are, you know, are, are following, but we have all these other social media platforms that I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of. But, uh, you know, our, our team, uh, it's this terrific team of folks across the country. We're in 15 states. And then, of course, we're partnered with our great sister organization, Americans for Prosperity. Uh, so you can always go to them, you know, to reach us. Uh, it it um, just all kinds of ways to reach the, the Libre Initiative. You know, w- one of the things that this podcast is about is government imposed barriers and breaking government imposed barriers. And as we've talked through this whole issue on immigration and border security, I think of the rancher down on the border. I think of yeah. the immigrant down on the border. These are government yeah. imposed barriers because it's a lack of government action. It's a lack of government's will to enforce the laws that they've already passed uh, that are imposing these burdens on the citizens and that this is what this is about passing good immigration reform that includes a strong border security package would help break those barriers that are imposed by the governments. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, the responsibility of immigration law and and statutes um, rest on the federal government. And unfortunately, a lot of the states are wrapped up into, you know, by the impact and the consequences of, of, of managing poorly the, the, uh, the border security like this administration has. And governors like uh, Greg Abbott are, are trying to do something about it by, you know, marshalling and, and, and mobilizing resources to, towards the border. Uh, but there's just so much that they can do because they don't have the, 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 the necessary authority to enforce uh, the illegal uh, activity that is happening at the border unless it's like cr- uh, some criminal action that is a state code. And so it, it really has tied the hands of the border states like Arizona and California and Texas. And, and that's a shame, right? Because it, it, this administration has just been so woefully inadequate uh, and, and, and they're trying to, to uh, manage the, the, the border area through executive actions that are actually undermining and weakening uh, the, the control that, that we have as to who comes in, right? You know, look, as Americans, we get to decide who comes into America and who doesn't. 
we you know put the conditions and the criteria and the numbers. Uh, but right now, with, with, with that is happening, uh, it is basically a welcome sign at the border, and, and it is taxing the resources of states, of local municipalities and counties, uh, and they are just overwhelmed, especially in, in the border areas. Uh, which is why you know, uh, folks like mayors in, in New York City uh, were were frustrated to no end because they started busing some folks over to to them, and, and they got a feel for what's happening here at the, at, in <laughs> right. the border region. So, of course, you know, and, and then they were complaining right out of the box, but but 100 X that as, as to what's happening here at the border. Uh, and and it, we need help. Yeah. Well, no question about it. And what you're doing through the Libre Initiative, Daniel, is is great. I appreciate the great work that you've done. And I want to thank you for for your time uh, joining us today. Thank you, sir. No, it's always a pleasure, Jeff. Um, appreciate the time. All right. Well, listen, if you want to get connected with Daniel, you want to want to know more about the Libre Initiative or Americans for Prosperity, send me an email. Jeff at AmericanPotential.com is the email address. Our podcast, of course, always looking for those stories to help keep you inspired and informed. And the best way to stay connected is by liking and subscribing to our channel, as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. You can also go to AmericanPotential.com if you know of a great story of someone working to expand freedom and opportunity and you'd want to share their story with us. You can go to AmericanPotential.com, fill out the share your story section. Thanks for joining us on American Potential. Thank you for listening to American Potential. You may listen to more stories from Americans working every day to expand freedom and opportunity in their communities by visiting AmericanPotential.com.